Okay, so last time we spoke, uh, we were talking about American society in the 1920s. Uh, we got around to the great unrest. We talked about that was an increase of labor strikes. Now labor began to lose here. Uh, we talked about how the progressive reforms ultimately failed. And we talked about that we had this one interview about how this one guy is talking about how labor issues are bad. They're not getting paid very much whatsoever. We also talked about the Boston police strike, right? And we talked about how the Boston police officers went on strike, 1,500 of them, and then what does Calvin Coolidge ultimately do? He fires all 1,500 of them, arguing, you may not go on strike when what? When it creates a danger to the public safety. So again, who may not go on strike? Maybe doctors, nurses, air traffic controllers, pilots, those kinds of things. So they, does that weaken labor unions? Yes, it does. It'll limit the power of labor unions because, sure, you can have a labor union, but you can't strike. That is a pretty powerful tool against labor unions. There was also the Great Steel Strike, so we can talk about this just briefly. But the Great Steel Strike also happened in September 1919. And the Great Steel Strike uh, was a strike at what steel company? It's U.S. Steel, the largest steel company in the world. Uh, it is at U.S. Steel, the Great Steel Strike. And here, 18,000 men go on strike across the country. 18,000 go on strike across the country. And again, folks, obviously it's never exactly 18,000. These are always just rough approximations. It could be like 17, 8, 6, 5, or we're just rounding. So uh, about 18,000 go on strike. And so in the business uses its old tool to stop labor unions by declaring the strike illegal. What tool is that when, you declare, when a court declares a strike illegal? Injunction, very good. So they filed, or they ruled, or they... Yeah, U.S. Steel, or the Supreme Court filed an injunction against the strike, making it illegal. Now, did U.S. Steel ask for the injunction? Of course they did. And so the Supreme Court files an injunction against the strike, making it illegal. You can't strike anymore. Furthermore, When they refused to stop striking, the strike continued, and uh, they put down the strike with what? Uh, yeah. Federal troops, which could be the National Guard. In this case, federales, federal troops. Again, the pen, I apologize. I'm getting a new computer soon. Like. I know, it's coming. Like, I'm just waiting. It's, I can feel it coming. It's, it's on a UPS truck on its way. I mean, if I could, I'd run out there once I got here. be like, ah! Start screaming. <laughs> the other thing that ends up happening then is they do begin something called the open shop movement. Today, this is called right to work. There are debates about this all the time throughout the country today. But the open shop movement begins in the 1920s. Again, the term for it today is right to work. It's the, sa it's the same type of movement, but they call it right to work today. Um, what an open shop movement did is that it banned requirements. Wait, I don't want to phrase this. Ban the requirement of yeah, it banned the requirement of workers to join unions. It banned the requirement for workers to join unions. It so didn't become bad, but many believed that unions were bad. Because many believed, I don't want to join a union. Why do I have to pay? Because you have to pay to be in a union. You have to pay fees because whatever the union does, they're helping you. So you're paying a fee to the union. So what Open Shops did was it said, you can't require workers to join a union. That's probably a better way to put it. You can't require workers to join a union. And so, for example, today in La Puente, I have to join a union when I work here. I'm required to. If I don't join the union and I don't want my fees to go to the union, 
that they will still collect that money, but instead of going to the union, I can say, well, can that money go to a charity instead? I can do that, but I still have to pay the money. Because do I benefit if the union creates a new contract? Yes. So what they're saying is you have to still be part of the union because you're benefiting from it, even if you don't want to pay the fees. And so let's say I did not like the union. I'd be like, oh, unions are terrible. Why do I have to join? The open shop movement made it so that you don't have to join a union anymore. Does that make sense? OK. Well, they did this because many people labeled unions as communists. They said, oh, unions are bad because unions are full of communists. So unions are bad, and we want to weaken their power. Now, this cartoon does kind of illustrate the power of unions. If this is the entire labor movement, can that whale swallow the entire union? No, it cannot. But if they stop being part of the union, can they swallow them up one at a time? And that's what the whale says. I mean, think about it, folks. In a union, an attack against one is attack against all. But if you're not in a union, an attack against one is an attack against one. And that's what it comes down to. And so the good part that people said was that, see, now unions won't be as powerful. They can't control business anymore. They won't strike as often. And therefore, business will be a lot more efficient. The downside, if you're a union member, is a lot of your power gets stripped away. You start losing a lot more power. Another example of unions losing power? You see the return of yellow dog contracts. What are yellow dog contracts? Who can tell me what a yellow dog contract is? Yes, you have to agree not to join a union. You have to promise not to join a union. If you do, what can I legally do? I can terminate your employment. I can fire you. OK? Good, good. So here's the thing, folks. A lot of this is happening because is business still being regulated by the government? No. So what happens is that with the decline of business regulation, you see the loss of labor power. Does that make sense? As businesses stop being regulated, businesses become more powerful. And when businesses become more powerful, unions become weaker. Make sense? It looks like this. Less regulation equals stronger businesses equals weaker labor unions. Question? Yeah, the progressives were. But the progressives are no longer in power. Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, they're no longer president. And the presidents that we have now, we'll talk about them near the end of the unit, these Republican presidents, they're all about laissez-faire. They're all about returning to big business. They're all about letting businesses take charge. And so you do see a loss of the progressive successes as a result. Yep, the presidents, the government, the people, they pretty much just gave up. Well, not gave up, but they just changed their mind. A new group of people came to power. Cool? That's where you see Democrats and Republicans, yes, switching again. 1920s. Any case, folks, uh, here you see that uh, they say that steel strike or strikes in America are being caused by what? What's it say on the flag there? So the suggestion is strikes are being caused by? Communists. communists. So again, strikes are caused by communists. Labor unions are bad because they're communists. And so here's why they're communists. Exactly. The argument was that labor unions were made up of what? Immigrants. And immigrants might be communists. And so, folks, where all of this is stemming from is the argument that because most labor unions are made up of immigrants and immigrants are communists, labor unions are communist. Everyone clear on that argument so far? Line of logic? OK. Now, were immigrants a threat to America? Yes and no is a correct answer. Were there some immigrants that were dangerous? Were there some real, true 
anarchist communist immigrants that were dangerous to America? Of course there were. In fact, there were eight different bombings by anarchist immigrants. So there was a threat. But were all immigrants a threat? But are we going to label all immigrants a threat? I mean, what's a modern day example of that exact same thing? Middle Easterners, maybe? Yeah. Oh, well, the uh, Osama bin Laden's a terrorist, and he's uh, from the Middle East, so naturally, all people from the Middle Easterners are terrorists. And that was the same example. If these eight bombings were caused by immigrants, then naturally, all immigrants must be terrorists, or anarchists, or dangerous. And so, were they a threat? Some. Were most? No, but are we going to treat them all as such? Of course. To respond to that threat in America already, folks, because we had fears of communism, A. Mitchell Palmer, the Attorney General, he begins what become known as the Palmer Raids. The A. Mitchell Palmer becomes what become known as the Palmer Raids. <laughs> I don't really know what his first name is. I don't know what his first name is. A. Mitchell Palmer began what became known as the Palmer Raids. And what the Palmer Raids did was that they would root out communists, or they would find communists, and then do what? Kill them. This is America, guys. We would deport them. We would deport them. No, we're not going to lynch them either. We're going to find communists and we're going to deport them. What does it mean to deport? Send them back to their country. So A. Mitchell Palmer seeks out communists and he deports them. In this image, you see a home ransacked by the Palmer Rage looking for evidence of communist ties. If they find one, aha, you're a communist. You're going back home, comrade. So... There's that. It's a wonderful image of A. Mitchell Palmer going across the country looking for communists and uh, putting them back on a boat. See? Here they are doing some investigation with the American flag, investigating these different members, and those that he catches, he's chaining them up. Make sense? Cool? It's a great picture. I love this picture. Cause it's, it's like kind of cute, but it's like terrible about the historical implication of what happened. You're like, oh, that's a really nice picture. Oh, now I see what's happening. That's, but again, look, here's the bomb. See, so clearly, examples. So, folks, here's what he did. He deported them. So, again, let me make that clear. The Palmer Raids found aliens uh, that were dangerous, and they deported all those illegal immigrants. Yes. So, America is the land of opportunity, unless you're a vicious alien, at which point we'll send you back home. Hey, the opportunity is only for those that are, are you know, safe and free. If you're dangerous or suspected dangerous, do we want to take that chance? No. no. Why would you? They're immigrants. Not like they have rights. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so you do see an example of extreme anti-foreignism or extreme anti-immigration in the uh, case of Niccolo... Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, or the Sacco and Vanzetti case. In the Sacco and Vanzetti case, folks, Sacco and Vanzetti were arrested for killing people, for killing two people. They were arrested for killing two people. Now, during the trial, what we found out was that there was no possible way they could have killed those people. They were in the different part of a city. They were fish salesmen. They were selling, selling stuff to the other side of town when these people were killed. There was no way they could have killed them. And so instead of this trial being about the evidence about how they clearly killed this person, the trial instead became about how they were Italian immigrants. It became about how they were anarchists. Their trial became about how they were draft dodgers. Anyone know what a draft dodger is? Yeah, they tried to pr avoid the draft during World War I. They are draft dodger. And they were atheists. Anarchists and atheists. 
So this case became them about being Italians, anarchists, draft dodgers, and atheists. All very unpopular beliefs and traits in America. Okay, they're immigrants, anarchists, draft dodgers, atheists. So they were clearly not guilty, right? They clearly did not murder this person, so they just made the trial about them being Italians, anarchists, draft dodgers, and atheists. And at the end of the trial, they were given the electric chair. What? They clearly did not murder those people. But they said, you know what? Let's kill them anyway. They're not the Rhine kind of people. And maybe they didn't kill anybody today, but they might in the future. You know, they're the wrong kind of people. And so they were killed anyway. Across the world, people protested their arrest. They said, we want justice, liberty or death. You know, this is a ghastly miscarriage of justice. They're clearly innocent. They should not be murdered. Uh, people protested. I mean, across the world. It wasn't just here in, uh, in the United States. Across the world, people protested throughout Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. They said, they're not, they're not guilty. They're innocent. But they were put to death for a crime they did not commit. And ultimately, why they killed them was because they held unpopular beliefs. And so, what is your assessment about anti-foreign sentiment in America? It's pretty high. It's pretty radical. Oh, uh, the plaque reads, what I wish more uh, than all in this last hour of agony is that our case and our fate be, may be understood in their real being and serve as a tremendous lesson to the forces of freedom so that our suffering and death will not have been in vain. So he says, that I hope people will learn from this. Our rights may be lost today, but we hope that we can be an example about how rights should never be lost again. Yeah. It'll, yeah, well, they tried. They said, you can't kill these people, but America is sovereign. America can do whatever it wants. It's just like, if, just like Italy is sovereign. If America does not have to listen to Italy. So there's that. Here's another great example. The death warrant, Sacco Vanzetti with the skull of liberty on top of it. As a result, folks, you do see the rise of nativism again. Okay, and so here is Uncle Sam trying to hold the flag of liberty away because of the danger to American ideas and institutions. What is the danger to liberty? Mexicans. <laughs> Many Mexicans in this image, uh, but also roughly just all kinds of immigration. Some of those are Italians. Many of those are Italians. But really it's, really it's any kind of immigration. But do you guys understand the illustration here? Right? We want to keep the liberty away from them because they might destroy it. Perhaps. And so, uh, in this rise of nativism, you see another resurgence of the KKK. Featured here is a KKK wedding. Yeah, it's a KKK wedding. Yes, it's a wedding. Woman, man. Well, don't judge them. Okay, judge them. But KKK are never illegal. Well, I guess if they're killing people, it's illegal. But if they're just believing that racism is okay, that's not illegal. It's okay to. It's not okay. It's legal to believe that racism is okay. It's legal. You have that right. First Amendment. Racism is not illegal. No. Acting on that racism is illegal. But racism in and of itself is not illegal. You have freedom of speech. By the way, the KKK comes to power uh, when D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation movie comes out. In this movie, this movie glorified the KKK. In Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith, this movie glorifies the KKK. Huh? Yes. Also, fun fact, this is the first full, so I say, this is the first, uh, I forget the terminology. It's the first full-length movie in America, and it's about the KKK. So, so you know, the first full-length movie in America is about the KKK. Here's a quick clip of it, uh, Birth of a Nation. Tell them to grab the left light, please. Yeah, 
Oops, I got that again. For the record, the reason why it's low is because my computer is also recording the screen at the same time. So my computer is overworking here. So those are in blackface, if you notice. Black man. Well, that guy is part of the, the white man is part of the KKK, and here he is, uh, again, fighting the black people because they're evil, trying to prevent them from uh, hiding out all the enemies. Uh-oh. So he shot him. And therefore, black people are bad. Because he shot him. Yeah. So that's our first full length movie. It's about how the KKK are awesome. So, go America. Here they are, again, being racist as usual, and eventually, you don't have to write this down, but the KKK does collapse when their leader, David Stevenson, their grand wizard, um, is caught. That's his title. Yes, that is his title. Um, he is caught for tax evasion, and thus it makes the KKK look like they're immoral. Be like, oh, what? I thought we were good Christians, and our leader is not paying his taxes. That's not American. Isn't that crazy? It's like, it's like, it's okay to be racist, but if you're not paying your taxes, oh, I thought you were a good Christian. <laughs> we leave, and so the KKK collapses as a result. <laughs> Stevens. Alexander. Uh, David Stevenson, sorry. Uh, in any case, folks, uh, they do start to root out on the undesirables because many people are still immigrating to America. So now the question is, now that everyone is coming to America, how do we make it such that of those that are coming, how do we limit the amount of people coming to America? And then make sure that the ones that are coming are the good ones, not the bad ones. 
Because many people are coming to America, you know, for all the nice things that we offer, no kings, no expensive taxes, that kind of thing. Um, skip that. And so the government says, yeah, we do have to root them out. So one way to do it, folks, our response to immigration is what? Literacy tests. You want to come to America? You got to learn how to what? Read. Read. Is that the case today? No, but actually, the new immigration reform law that's going to be passed might require that for those 11 million illegal immigrants in America, one of the requirements will be that you have to speak English. You have to learn how to speak English. Otherwise, you, but again, if they're here illegally, the argument is in order to achieve legal status, you have to learn to speak English. That's fine. I mean, that's not a problem. But you have to be able to learn and speak and read English. But if they can still communicate, then that's different. <laughs> Basically, uh, there's a teacher next door. Uh, the land of the free. Literacy test. OK, hold on. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, what you end up happening, having folks, is a uh, Ellis Island. Uh, many of the immigrants are being um, filtered through Ellis Island. Okay, uh, and I think we talked about this already previously, but many of the immigrants are being filtered through Ellis Island. Uh, the European immigrants, anyway, are being filtered through Ellis Island. And when they get filtered, this is where they're going to take their uh, literacy tests. They'll also be taking physical exams. Physical exams. They'll be taking physical exams. Um, so again, if you're sick, if you're diseased, are they going to let you into America? If you're mentally handicapped, you won't be allowed into America. If you have a physical handicap, you won't be allowed into America. Pretty much, they don't want the undesirables. If you want to be an American, you have to be the best of the best. Yes? Ah, at first, it's you can come if you want, but we're going to change that pretty quickly. We used to have a policy of open immigration. Anyone can come at any time, and it doesn't matter from where. If you're here, you're in, provided that you are not an undesirable. That'll change pretty quickly. But when they come to America, folks, here they are. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it's about a family that's first arriving for the first time and seeing the Statue of Liberty. Again, the suggestion that you know this is freedom. We finally made it. Um, here's Ellis Island, where they do start processing the immigrants. And here they are answering questions, exams, whatever else. And uh, they do end up separating men and women. You don't have to know this part too much. But they do separate men and women at Ellis Island. Um, and sometimes they're being processed and questioned for maybe 10 hours, 12 hours, 4 hours, whatever. And many of them fear that maybe they won't be let into America. But if you do get through all of that and you're not sent back home, because they might send you back home if you are an undesirable, you walk down the stairs of separation on one side is men and the other side is women, because they do separate them. And then at the very bottom is a pole called the kissing post, because that's where families would re be reunited again. And they would kiss, and you're like, oh, I, I missed you. I'm so glad that you're here. And they called it the kissing post. So you can go to Ellis Island, see the stairs of separation and the kissing post, because it still is there today. It's a very nice place to be. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. If we go, if we go to, if we go to New York anytime soon. Now, on the opposite coast is Angel Island in San Francisco, and in San Francisco, you can actually visit this today as well. You can take a cruise from uh, the pier, uh, Fisherman's Wharf, rather, to Angel Island. Angel Island is where they processed Asian immigrants. And in particular, which group of Asian immigrants? I'm sorry, did you say Japanese? It was my understanding that in 1907, Japanese were no longer immigrating to America because of the Gentlemen's Agreement, which means Chinese immigrants were being processed. Now. They were processing what became known as legal immigrants because, again, are Chinese actually allowed to immigrate to America? No Chinese Exclusion Act, right? But children could still come, and very, every so often we would allow. But some of those children or sons were called paper sons. Does anyone know why we called them paper sons? Huh? 
actually not. The complete opposite. The argument was, if I am an American, if I was born here, I live here, I'm a citizen, then I had the opportunity to say, can I bring my family over once I'm an American citizen? So I could. And so I would bring my wife and my children and maybe my sons. Paper sons, however, were what? Uh, actually, it wasn't even their children. They were their children on paper. But they weren't really their children. It's like a fake marriage. Does that make sense? And so they would say, oh, you should bring my son over as well. Here's his paperwork. Can you get his visa for me? And then these paper sons, who were really only sons on paper, would be offered citizenship if they passed the test. Because this became such a common practice, and do you think some families would pay for this to happen? Of course. Um, many of these people coming to America would be interviewed and these under these intense interview processes. I have a transcript of one of the questions they would ask you. And they would say, what is your name? My name is C. Young. How many windows are there in your house? There are 12. How many houses in your row? There are 10. Where are the kitchens? My kitchen is near the small door. Where does your oldest son sleep? Uh, my oldest son sleeps near the larger. Where do you sleep? I sleep in the second room. They might ask you, what is the name of the family that lives across the street from the home on the right? But why would they ask that? Yeah, to see if you actually were the son. If you grew up with this family, then you should actually know who these people are. How can I help you? Um, where are you? She is, she's right there. Ah, and so whenever you sent over uh, a letter, per se, uh, you would, like, let's say you, you were going to ask to be my paper son, I would send you a cheat sheet. And then on your trip from China to America, you would study that cheat sheet. How many, how many guys know how many windows are in your house? Anyone? Probably don't, right? You can know for sure? I mean, no, like who lives across the street? How many houses are on your row? But these are questions that you're just expected to know. Most people don't know that. I don't even know that, you know? And so it, it comes down to, I mean, do you really know your home? And they are going to quiz you. Unlike people living on Ellis Island that may, ha, might maybe had to stay there for maybe at most a day or two if their processing took a lot longer, for people living uh, being processed through Angel Island, many of them had to live there weeks if not months. And you could not leave, and your only option if you didn't want to stay was to go all the way back to China. And so many of them were so depressed about their stay that many of them wrote poems and carved them in all the walls throughout the barracks. So if you go to Angel Island today, all over the walls you'll see these poems carved into the stone, into the wall. Uh, these are just short Chinese haikus of like depression, loneliness, that kind of thing all throughout. It's actually pretty sad. Uh, this one, I don't know. I do have a translation of one of them on the other computer, but I'll pull that out later. Um, and so we are processing them. But we figure, you know, we're processing them here, but an even better way is to prevent them from coming already from Europe. So in 1921, we passed what became known as the Emergency Quota Act, or the Immigration Act of 1921. In the Immigration Act of 1921, or the Emergency Quota Act, what the law said was that we would stop open immigration. Open immigration was first come, first serve, right? Anyone can come from anywhere at any time. It ended open immigration, and it created a quota system. It created a quota system. And it clearly stated a quota system. And what that said in that quota was only 3% it's annoying. I don't like this pen. It's, it's just say 3%. Uh, only 3% of those already, sorry, 3% of the number of Americans already living in America, only 3% of the number of Americans already living in America from your country may come. So only 3% of the number of Americans already living in 
America from your country, from your country, may come? Yeah, only 3% of those, 3% of the number of those already living in America from your country may come. So let me explain what that means. If there are 100, uh, let's say, Mexicans in America in 1890, how many Mexicans are allowed to come? Three. If there are 10,000, how many can come? 300. That's what that means. So if there are already 10,000 Italians in America, we'll only allow 3% more every year. Does that make sense? And every year, it's the same amount, 3%, 3%, 3%. So 3,000 a year, 3,000. So only 3,000 from your country, maybe 1,200 from your country, maybe 6,000 from your country, maybe 30 from your country. Does that make sense? So there's a quota system. And, and is each country going to be equal? No. Here's the other thing. It did not apply to Northern and Western European countries. It did not apply to Northern and Western Europe. It did not apply to England, France, Germany, or Ireland. Why? Because those are the good Americans, right? Those are the Americans that made it. Which is the ironic one there? And the Irish. Remember the Irish and the Germans were like the ones we didn't want? Now they're like, oh, no, you guys are cool. You guys can come. Because you're Irish. The Irish have always been American. Unless we forget what happened in the 1840s. But now the Irish are like, hey, don't come to my country. We're allowed to come, but not you guys. Everyone understand Emergency Quota Act? It's a 3% quota, yes. It's a 3% of the number of those already in America. Oh, it did not apply to Northern and Western Europeans. England, France, Germany, Ireland. Cool. Yeah. Census. Every 10 years. Part of the Constitution. Every 10 years, we have to take a census. Also, it's 3% of the 1890 census. I should probably make that clear. It's not, this, it's not from every year. It's from the 1890 census. So 3% of that number. Not of 1910, not of 1900. 1890 when immigration was still starting. So they want to limit that amount of immigration. So it's from the 1890 census. Cool. Then in 1924, they were like, you know what, let's do this again. And they had the National Origins Act of 1924. And in this one, they lowered the quota to a 2% quota. it becomes a 2% quota, which is even less than before. Also, they banned Asians completely. Except for which group that's allowed to come? Chinese, no way. Filipinos, why? Because we own them. And they're US citizens, right? No. <laughs> no, they're not U.S. citizens. Come on. Maybe eventually. Yeah, they are U.S. citizens. Jones Act. So come on. 2% quota. And all Asians are banned. What? Because some states have not become states yet. Also Hawaii and Alaska. And so the belief was that America must be kept America. Yeah, Coolidge was president at the time when he said it. So, again, we'll go through all the presidents after all of this. And so here are the numbers, guys. Here are some interesting numbers you guys might want to take a look at. Uh, immigration uh, from Eastern Europe and Poland. Look what happened to immigration by 1928. At 138,000 down to 14,000. Southern Europe, almost 300,000 to 22,000. From Asia, 25,000 to 4,000. That's a huge jump. Now, Mexico was different. <laughs> but do you guys know why? The reason why is that we actually had open immigration with Mexico. We had guest worker programs, and we actually needed the workers from Mexico to come in to work on farms. This was actually a, a common thing. 
This was not unusual. This was not illegal immigration. There was open trade and open worker policies with Mexico. Sure, I mean, other Central American countries as well. Mexico was the easiest, though. It was literally just across the border. So, All right, everyone good with immigration? Any questions about immigration at all? Everyone cool with that? OK. Next key topic we're talking about today, folks, the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Scopes Monkey Trial. Here's the background. In 1924, Tennessee passed the Butler Law. In 1924, Tennessee passed the Butler Law. B-U-T-L-E-R. In 1924, Tennessee passed the Butler Law. Can anyone tell me what the Butler Law said? You may not teach evolution in schools. You can't teach that myth in schools. Yes, heavily religious. <coughs> passed by a very religious state at the time. You may not teach evolution in schools or anything counter to the Bible. So clearly, heavily influenced by a Christian group, right? Yeah. Very heavily influenced by Christian society. So they said evolution is illegal. You may not teach it. You know, you're promoting hell in the high school, is what they said. You're blaspheming. I'm not gonna let my I'm not gonna let you fill my child with these ridiculous ideas that man came from monkeys. Are you crazy? Well, so here's what happened. A science teacher by the name of John Scopes was hired by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, to break the law. He was hired to teach evolution by the ACLU. Why? So that what? Well, they wanted him to teach it. Is he going to get arrested? Yeah. Of course he is. And if you get arrested, then what will happen next? It's going to go to trial. And is that what they wanted? Yeah. Because ultimately, who gets to decide this law? The courts. The courts. And so they said, let's take this uh, law to trial. So they hired John Scopes. They paid for his attorney. They paid for his bond, everything. Said, you're going to go to jail for a little bit. We're going to get you out. We want you to do this for us. So he said, OK. He taught biology and evolution. He was arrested. Clarence Darrow will defend him. Clarence Darrow is the name of the attorney who will defend him. And this court case was a case between modernists. What's a modernist? I mean, for our intent and purposes, folks, it's a modernist Christian. It's someone who believives that Christianity can work co uh, sci uh, hand in hand with what? Science. Science or evolution, right? So a modernist was a Christian that believed in evolution. And it's a modernist versus what? Someone who believed that the world was created in only seven days. That Not just Christians or creationists, but fundamentalists. <laughs> Fundamentalists could be creationists. But the people that believe that the world was created in uh, you know, seven days, that uh, the world has only been around for 6,000 years, those are creationists, fundamental people that take the Bible literally word for word. Okay, And so what it came down to was, what is it now? And this was a huge case. And the entire country was watching, and the entire country criticized Tennessee. You guys are crazy. You're telling me that the world is literally only 6,000 years old when science tells us otherwise? So there was a court case. And this court case, like I said, was a spectacle. Everyone paid attention to this case because they thought it was just so ridiculous. They even brought monkeys to the court. I mean, just like as a sideshow outside, just like to, to show how ridiculous this court case was. No, thou shalt not think, you know, some of the illustrations. Like, you're telling me that these people are not allowed to think about evolution? That's crazy. 
You know, that you know, these, these people were so afraid of evolution that, you know, speak not, hear not, see not. The idea that, you know, science was going to lead all these people off the cliff. That we were all going to die. We're going to believe in disbelief in the Bible and that Darwin was the devil. You know, the idea that, you know, you may not eat from the tree of knowledge. And again, using that biblical reference to suggest, even today, you may not eat from the tree of knowledge. You should be completely shunned from knowledge because knowledge is sin. Fun fact, folks, this is a cartoon from last week. There are schools today that teach that evolution is not real that the world is only 6,000 years old, that mankind and dinosaurs coexisted a la the Flintstones. <laughs> there, there is a creation museum that shows that there was a time in which mankind rode dinosaurs like ho horses. But that is what exists. And this is still a problem today, guys. Your taxes are paying for that. And that's a concern. And ultimately, folks, Whatever your personal faith and belief is, evolution is real. It's a scientific fact. It's observable. We've seen it. It happens in nature. Yes. As, as crazy as it is that we came from monkeys, we kind of did. I also like this one. All those in favor that man is not related to the monkey, monkeys are like, oh, no, no, we're definitely not related because the only people that would vote for this were monkeys and creationists. Does that make sense? Yeah. You got the cartoon? Right, and yes. The person prosecuting John Scopes was our good friend William Jennings Bryan. So he was the guy that was a creationist. So our good friend William Jennings Bryan was the prosecutor. Okay, so William Jennings Bryan, WJB, he prosecuted, saying that, and he would go and make these long speeches about, don't you understand that when Noah's Ark flooded the world and God created the world in seven days, that those are real stories, not just stories, but fact. And the reality is that if we go down this road, then the world will go down this road. And then we will cast the world asunder in fire and hell. And this is not what we should be teaching. Darwin is the devil. Those kinds of things. That's what was taught. That was, that was happening in, in this trial. You know, people thought, you know, what would the verdict be? Because majority of these people were Tennesseans that believed that creation was the way to go. And so, you know, like, how will the monkeys vote? It was in Tennessee. Um, because it was about Tennessee law. Yes. Eventually, folks, here's the other motive is that, you know, oh, of course, before Neanderthals, you have creationists. Because clearly, Neanderthals are after creationists, is the argument here. Like, if you believe that the world's only 10,000 years old, then you clearly are not as smart as a man who devised, you know, the stick and the pole and the spear. Also, the rise and fall of man. We went from primates to Neanderthals to Socrates, are pretty good, and then William Jennings Bryan. <laughs> I was like, what are you thinking? Does everyone get the illusion? And I am by no means trying to insult anyone or their beliefs, but again, if you've been taught that evolution is a myth, I'm sorry, but that is not the case. It is a fact. Okay. Ah, here's a fun part too. So, after all of this, John Scopes was found guilty. Regardless, John Scopes was found guilty and he had to pay like $200. But the ACLU paid it. The ACLU still paid his fee. He lost the case. He's found guilty. But even though Tennessee kept its law, because Tennessee law kept its law, the world or the nation saw these fundamentalists as crazy. Does that make sense? Ultimately, the real trial was not the trial of John Scopes. It was a trial on fundamentalism. 
And even though John Scopes lost, the modernists won. Make sense to everyone? Yeah. Questions there? Cool. Uh, let's talk about prohibition. So what did prohibition do? Well, prohibition banned alcohol. We've talked about this in detail. So now we're going to talk about what it led to, the impact of prohibition. Because we talked about banning alcohol as, as a success. Now what's going to happen next? Well, ladies and gents, we banned alcohol in uh, the United States in 1919. Become a saloonless nation. Volstead Act. I don't have to write this down again, but just write down Volstead Act. You don't have to re-explain it. You guys should know, though, right? Volstead Act, banned alcohol, all that stuff. Just know it. Um, so again, people start buying alcohol because alcohol is about to go away. I says, wait a minute. Alcohol doesn't have to go away. We can just hide it. And so, what you see are the emergence of what become known as speakeasies. Ah. <laughs> speakeasies. It's one word. I apologize for the stupid pen. Soon. Soon! Speakeasies. It broke. Well, it was already broken, and then it was cracked, and so I had taped it, and then the tip got stuck in the pen in the computer, so now I can get it out. So it's not really broken, it's just cracked, but I'm like, oh no. Uh, speakeasies were underground bars, secret underground bars, and they were called speakeasies because, you guys ever watch movies where you walk down an alley and there's like a giant door, so you go bong, 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 because you knock on it? And some guy like opens that small slit door and they're like, what's the password? And you're like, Saratoga. And they're like, come on in. So, yes. No, I have not. Cool. Uh, so, <laughs> the speakeasies uh, were the secret underground clubs. Oftentimes, folks, speakeasies might be in government buildings, they might be underground underground bowling alleys, uh, they might be in libraries. Whenever there was a secret room, you might like cover it by library case, you would open it, people would go. They might be behind restaurants. I mean, they were just all over the place. And the reason why they were so popular is that many people really want to stop drinking. No, so even though the government banned alcohol, it's not like government officials actually stopped drinking. Many politicians went to speakeasies, police officers, whomever joined speakeasies. Here they are, drinking openly in a speakeasy, secretly. Now again, we did try to find it and to sink it and destroy it and all that stuff, so that did try to happen. Um, but one of the people that became most successful at selling illegal alcohol or bootlegging was Al Capone. And Al Capone became one of the biggest crime bosses at this time because he sold alcohol. He was a bootlegger. And through bootlegging, Al Capone became one of the wealthiest people in America. If I remember correctly, Al Capone made upwards of like $40 million a year. Maybe less than that. That seems ridiculous. Yeah, it does. I'll have to look that up later. I know it's a crazy amount, though. It's still a lot. Maybe it's like $9 million. I forget. Ah, so they were illegally transporting it from Mexico, Canada, whatever else. Uh, they were, uh, so they're illegally transporting it or importing it from other countries, um, hence the term bootleg. You guys know where the term name bootleg comes from? So you had a boot, and then in that boot, you had like almost like a bubble bag around it, and that bag would be filled with liquor. And your foot would go inside. Would your feet ever touch the liquor? No. no. But the boot was surrounded by liquor. The bootleggers. Uh, the other thing uh, was that they would race them on cars. And so do you guys uh, familiar with NASCAR? NASCAR was created by bootleggers. Because those that drove the fastest and ran away from the cops began to race each other. And that's where NASCAR comes from. <laughs> Bootleggers who used to run away from cops. And now that's NASCAR. Uh, Al Capone eventually became very wealthy. And after doing uh, alcohol, he began to also sell drugs, prostitution, gambling. 
He is eventually arrested, but never uh, uh, caught for doing any of those things. Does anyone know why he was arrested? Huh? He didn't pay his taxes. Yeah, yeah, you can, you, yeah, you can get away with a lot of things, but paying your taxes is not one of them. You have to pay your taxes. They, it's, it's, I mean, I'm paying my taxes today because I don't want to get caught. That's so crazy. Speakeasies we talked about, secret clubs. So again, like I said, it's not a small club. It's a huge secret club. People did try to grow their own, not to worry about any of this, uh, but people did try to grow their own liquor. Moonshine, for example, you know, you're growing liquor in your own bathtub and then people dying because it's poison. So that was dangerous, and that happened. And people said, you know, repeal it. The 18th Amendment is bad. We should get rid of it. You know, this is ruining America. So many people thought that the 18th Amendment was just ruining America. Uh, many people wanted to get rid of prohibition. So there were a lot of people wanting to vote America wet again. Interestingly enough, folks, once prohibition was passed, what happened to the number of people being arrested for alcohol? It increased. it increased, which means what did people keep doing despite the law? Drinking. Kept drinking. And what that signifies, folks, is that the Prohibition era created a culture of law breaking. It creates a culture of law breaking in America. And that's pretty interesting, folks, because nowadays it's cool to break the law. Like, you know what? We spent 20 years doing it, or 13 years doing it. So, yeah, break the law, whatever. No big deal. Everyone's doing it. So it creates it, but it's true. Everyone was doing it for the most part. So it created a culture of law breaking, which is kind of interesting. Were the I mean, were they drinking? Yes. Did they ever catch them publicly? No. But were they drinking? Of course. Of course. Of course. Anyway, everyone good on a prohibition? Cool? Cool, cool. Mass consumption economy then. Now we have an economy. People are going to buy stuff. Let's call these folks then. This is the beginning of the good times. Because while that other stuff was kind of bad, this is all good. This is all good stuff. And then there's going to be some bad stuff too. So, here we go. Mass consumption economy. We're going to start buying a lot of random stuff during this time period. Kind of appliances. So, here you have a stove and an oven. Here you have a dishwasher. You would soak your clothes in the middle and spin it around and you would dry them on the tube up top. Oh, yeah, sorry, washing machine, not dishwasher. <laughs> Thank you. A toaster. Yeah. It would create so much smoke <laughs> like these. When toasters were first introduced, people thought their houses were on fire all the time because there'd just be all this smoke coming out of the toaster. Because, but, and, but it was. It was just like making toast. That's all it was. But it was burning the bread until all the smoke would you know, come out of it. And so that's uh, the first toaster there. Pretty much you just put it inside and you just switch sides. So first toaster, interesting. Isn't that weird? I want one and then burn my house down. Um, and then here's the thing. We're buying all this stuff, guys. Look, we're spending all this money on stuff. But the problem is as we're increasing our spending, what else is happening? Our debt is increasing, which means we're buying, but what's the problem? Yeah, we don't have the money to buy it. So what are we, how are we buying it? We're buying things on credit, right? So what you see the beginning of is buying things on credit. The buying of things on credit or buying of things in installments is another way to put it. Uh, by the way, folks, what is the most common thing to buy on credit or an installment today? Cars, cars, cars are bought on installment. A mortgage is different from a loan for a car. A mortgage is very different. Uh, so an installment, again, for example, I, I bought a car, but I didn't have the money to pay for it, so did I go into debt? Yes, I did. And I was paying installments because I could not pay for a car in full cash, so I borrowed money and I was paying in debt. The problem is back then, they don't really understand debt, though they should because they've had several depressions already. But they forgot. And so they begin to borrow all this money. And the problem is, are they going to be able to pay it all back? That'll lead to a Great Depression, guys. It'll get there soon. 
One other philosophy that emerges at this time is by Calvin Coolidge. He comes up again. And the idea was that the man who builds a factory builds a temple. The man who works there worships there. So the basic idea is that he wanted business to become a religion. You know, that when you build a factory, who's going to worship you? Workers. Your workers. Your, temp your business is their temple. And they will worship you because you give them money. And so business should be a religion. And it should be the religion of money. So are we becoming pretty materialistic again? I mean, weren't we supposed to walk away from this during the progressive era, and now we're coming right back to it? Yeah. It's like the Gilded Age all over again. Well, folks, uh, the economy is growing rapidly by this time. I'll come back to that slide in a second. Um, one key example is that um, electricity use has increased by 1,900%. Nice. Electricity use has increased by 19%. 19 times is another way to do it, or 1,900%. Electricity use has increased by, by 1,900% or just by 19-fold or 19 times. Uh, before World War I, only 20% of people had electricity. By 1930, 70% had electricity. So before World War I, 20%. By 1930, 70%. Now it's like 99%. There's still some that don't. Maybe they choose not to. 20% before World War I, 1930, 70%. Okay, so one way to make society efficient then. Uh, was through a technique created by a man named Frederick Taylor. And he created something called scientific management, which we also sometimes call Taylorism. So scientific management by Frederick Taylor or Taylorism. Pretty much, here's the two things you have to know about it. Number one. It applied the scientific method to the factory system. It applied the scientific method to the factory system. It applied the scientific method to the factory system. So what you would do is you would test. Okay, suppose we were uh, making pieces of paper or whatever, making books. So let's say that this book needed a book jacket on it. So if the book is here and the book jacket is here, is it efficient for me to have to walk all the way over here each time, put the book jacket on, and walk all the way back? No. But if the book jacket is, let's say, here, and this the book is here, is that efficient either? No. Well, look, I have to somehow put the book inside, and that that's not a good way to do it either. What if the book is laid out flat? Well, let's try that next. So they did trial runs, and they just took a stopwatch, and they tested, and they tested, and they tested. The goal was to maximize time and efficiency. The goal was to maximize time and efficiency. Because as the saying goes, time is money. It uh, maximized time and efficiency because time is money. So here are people working using scientific management. And here's some data to give you an example, uh, some modern day examples, how we use it today. Before, when you go to a grocery store, they had those arm scanners, right? Yes. Scan all your products one at a time. That took about 6.12 seconds per item. But if everyone had a tag and you slid it on the bottom on those table scanners, that's 4.6 seconds. Let's assume that uh, everyone buys, what? Let's say 12 groceries, let's say 10 groceries on average. And let's say a grocery store has, let's say, 400 customers a day. And let's say there are, what, 1,200 grocery stores in California? And then there are 50 states? Will you end up saving a lot of time? Yeah. Yes. Another example, folding apparel before bagging. Well, if you fold each item one at a time, that's going to end up taking 11.51 seconds. But if you fold them all together, just fold it, put it in a bag, that's going to save you a total of six seconds. Imagine how many customers you'll have in a year 
bagging. Instead of having to stack the bag, open it up, put the stuff in, what if you have a bag already open, you just slide it in, and good, you're good to go. That's going to save you four seconds. And then paying with plastic. You guys don't remember this anymore, but when I uh, was in high school, I had a credit card or at least a debit card already, and if I bought something at McDonald's for like two bucks, I still had to sign for it. You don't have to do that anymore if it's under $25. And that's going to save them almost nine seconds. And do a lot of people buy things under $25? Yes. So imagine how much time they're saving in the course of a year. One other really good example, folks, FedEx and UPS try to make as few left turns as possible. Yeah, mostly only right turns. The reason why is that if you're at a left turn and it's uncontrolled, is it possible that you're going to wait in line and then not be able to make a left? Yes. So they say, and you can make a right even when it's a red light, right? But with the left, you have to wait till it's green. So if you're trying to maximize your time and you're sitting on your, if you're sitting in your car and you're just idling, waiting for it to turn green, that's wasting gas. Now imagine how many miles they drive a day versus how many trucks they have, how many times a year, and they calculated that making as many rights as possible will save them millions of dollars a year. Isn't that crazy? But that's scientific management. They tested it. You know, like, you ever had, like, two paths on your way home and you wonder, I wonder which one would be faster. You know, there are three ways for me to get home, and I always wonder myself, which freeway should I take and it will get me home faster? So you do science, and you time yourself, or you check your mileage, and you see what was my efficiency by the time I got home. That's scientific management. Well, a man by the name of Henry Ford took the idea of scientific management and applied it to his company. So Henry Ford decided he was going to apply Taylorism, the assembly line, and interchangeable parts together. So he decides to combine the assembly line, Taylorism, or scientific management, and interchangeable parts. Created by who? Eli Whitney. So Whitney, Ford, and Taylor. Interchangeable parts, Taylorism or scientific management, and the assembly line. And with that, folks, he creates the Ford Motor Company and makes the first mainstream American car known as the Model T. Grr, T. It's not the first car, but it's the first mainstream car. It's the first main American car. It's not even the first brand. BMW came out far before Amer uh, Henry Ford, but BMW is based in Germany. Mm -hmm. It's not even the first American, it's the first main American car. There are other cars before this, but the Model T became the first mass-produced car. Because by the time we began mass production, before it would take 14 hours to make a car, it's still a long time. I mean, you still have a lot of people working on it. But by the time the assembly line was over and completed and efficient, you can make a car in 1.5 hours. That's a tenth of the time. Huge change. Um, uh, eventually, by 1929, guys, because Ford had so many factories churning out so many cars, you would have a new Model T out on the floor every 10 seconds. Every 10 seconds, there would be a new Model T created, and we'd roll out on, off the factory floor. Every 10 seconds. Why so many, folks? By 1930, there were 30 million cars in America. Of those 30 million cars by 1930, 20 million were Model Ts. So it became the first modern American car. So again, by 1930, there were 30 million cars. By and of those 30, 20 million were Model Ts. Huh? Ah, you'll see that in just a second. Huh? Yeah, 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 no, we sell like what, like maybe 1.2 million cars a year, maybe even, even that. No, now everyone's still buying cars for the first time. 
We don't do this much anymore, but still, producing a lot. Uh, here's your answer. In a spot that could park six cars, here you can park 48. This is like a gumball machine elevator car. Elevator for cars. This is the first vertical automatic parking machine in commercial operation. It is installed in the heart of Chicago's busy loop district. The installation shown here occupies a ground space not to exceed that promulgated by six automobiles. The capacity of this machine is 48 cars. The skip operation is such that it will require not to exceed 50 seconds to deliver a car from the highest owner. This combination of automatic service with speed prevents the delay and congestion which might otherwise occur. <laughs> Does that answer your question? License plate. Like, how do you know it's your car? Yeah. License plate. By the way, you guys know the license plate with your driver's license? If you're going to go to a different car, you have to take your license plate with you, with your driver's license. So back then, you take your license plate wherever you go because you don't want people stealing your driver's license. It was your, it was your license plate and your driver's license at the same time. Hey, I've lost my wallet. Where is it? It's on the front of my car. Yes. What? Yeah, you could. It's expensive, but you could. Those are all fine. I don't know. Anyway, folks, obviously car travel is better than horse travel. I'm doing stuff with cars. Stuff. Here's some ads for cars back then. The Ford Junior. This is one of the first cars you were talking about. It was one of the cars before the Model T. Again, still emerging. But again, it wasn't made in 1.5 hours. It was made in 14. So it's still a slow car to be produced. Eventually, you have your Model T for $650. That's not cheap. That's a lot of money. But for me, I could buy that right now. Sweet. You can put a down payment of 265 and you can get the, the runabout there. Look at that. Pretty nice. Pretty sweet. <laughs> I don't know. Again, probably like twelve, twenty thousand dollars. So about the same price today. In any case, folks, the impact of the automobile industry was the following. It replaced the steel industry as king of American industry. It replaced steel as king of the American industry, let's put it that way. It replaced steel as king of American industry. Steel was no longer king. Now it's automobiles. They also employed 6 million workers. Ford employed 6 million, not Ford, but I guess it's automobiles in general, employed 6 million workers. So are a lot of people working for the car companies. Isn't that still one of the major uh, companies today? Yeah, yeah car companies. Um, it led to other industries. 6 million. It led to uh, the growth of other industries like steel. Why might steel benefit from this? Yeah, the cars are made out of steel, or the base of the car. Also, oil companies emerge at this time as being successful. Rubber companies. Why rubber? Tires. Tires. Also, the belts. Glass will emerge at this time. Gas stations will emerge at this time. Motels will emerge at this time. Why motels? Yeah. yeah, long travels. You would stay at places like the Motel 6, where it would only cost you $6. Oh, that, now it's like $54.99. But I thought Motel 6 was only 6 bucks Per night, yes. Uh, but again, if you want it to be high class, you go to the Motel 8. A little bit nicer. That's... That's posh living right there. <laughs> it destroyed the railroad industry, guys. I mean, here's Route 66, one of the major railroads that we built, or, or the roads that we built. Um, so here's one of the roads. But it does destroy the railroad industry. Why? Fewer people are using it. 
yeah, fewer pe more people have cars to drive. And here's the problem, folks. If I want something delivered to my door, can a train do that? No, there's no tracks. And so cars take more of the business. Trucks take more of the business. Unfortunately, folks, it also increases buying on credit, which is not a good thing. Because, folks, are most people buying cars? Do they have the money for it? No, so they're buying cars on credit. So it increased on credit purchasing. What's up? Yay. Top seven, y'all. I'm top seven. I don't know. I might, I don't know. They don't, wait, first of all, we don't say who. We just like, these are the top seven. Usually we don't do that because it's like the top seven might be like 59 and then 30, 32, 12, and 6, and everyone else got like two, you know? So whenever, when I used to do, as a most inspirational teacher for ASB, uh, we made it so that you didn't tell. He's like, we'll take the top eight, but we won't say who got the most. It's just like, you're top eight. Good job. No idea. It could be me. I don't know. I got 66. That's pretty cool. Um, right. It resulted in on credit pur or purchasing with credit, which is not a good thing, is it? That's going to become a serious problem. Uh, like I said, folks, here are people. Look at how many people are buying cars on credit. Look at that's a lot. That's way too many people buying cars on credit. Today, it's even more, but it's different now. And the other problem, folks, is workers became less what? Less skilled because is the job easier to perform? And if workers are less skilled, yeah, unions are weaker. Okay, so again, the correlation here is that labor workers became less skilled therefore unions are weaker because what can you do with the unskilled worker replace them hooray you guys remember stuff all right advertising listerine guys advertising um glorified consumption in america advertising glorified consumption Guys, goods became status symbols, right? Goods became status symbols. And so advertising glorified consumption because goods became a status symbol. One example of status, you owned Listerine. Because, folks, Listerine would cure halitosis. What is halitosis? Bad Chronic bad breath, which, fun fact, was a disease created by Listerine to scare people into buying Listerine. So they said, guys, uh, I can do this anyway. Guys, everyone has red blood cell disease, so go buy crackers. It's the only cure. Go buy crackers for your red blood disease. Now, is that a real disease? Just like halitosis was not, but they were able to get enough doctors to say, nine out of 10 doctors recommend Listerine to cure halitosis. <laughs> halitosis is not, I mean, chronic bad breath is not a real thing. Bad breath is a real thing, but you cure it pretty easily by brushing your teeth or using mouthwash. But in any case, folks, was it a successful campaign? Yes. So that was successful. Again, if it's bad, you won't be welcome. Play safe and use Listerine. Cool. Um, also, folks, uh, other things, they altered the image of beauty for women. They altered the image of beauty for women, what it meant to be beautiful in society changed. Nowadays, instead of you believing you were beautiful, you'd have to look to what to find the comparison? Magazines, articles, advertising. Do I look like these people? So that all of a sudden becomes the barometer for beauty. Yeah, yeah, they just, be, they began to choose a type of person to say, this is what beauty is. And then if these people are what's beautiful, then am I that? And that changed the image of what beauty was in America. Um, yeah, I mean, it, that's ultimately what it is. Um, here they are selling women's deodorant. 
Mum is the word. Don't tell anyone that the reason why you don't stink is you use mum. <laughs> Fun fact. So if you have to use deodorant, mum is the word. But again, folks, what happened was that they changed the image of women, and women were now expected to be more sexual. There was an expectation that women had to be more sexual. They, fun women smoked, fun women drank. And so there's a change in what women are perceived to be. Are you a cool woman or a bad woman? Are you the type of woman that's no, no fun to be with? If you're a young woman, you should be drinking, smoking, and you know, looking sexy. That's the expectation of women at this time. Here they are. Drinking, smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we talked about shoes and products. It's like, do you have the newest shoe? Do you have them all? You know, they became like Pokemon, collect them all. But again, but this is, but this is what's happening, guys, is that it becomes glorified. You have to buy things or else you're not a real American. There's an expectation. If you don't have this, then you're nobody. So there is an expectation of consumption. There's an expectation of purchasing. Women are now, um, they now, they now start marketing towards women because women are now perceived as consumers. Women are perceived as consumers. So now our ads target women, not men, women. Because who knows what to buy, who knows what's best to buy for the household, men or women? Men. Women do, they work there all the time, so women are now the targets. But that's the argument. They also made horribly racist uh, advertisements for kids by a saxophone from a man in blackface because it's fun. Here's Tom Brown. Awesome. Now, with the purchasing of all of this, folks, what again becomes a problem? People begin buying on credit. So again, yeah, it's exactly what it is, folks. All of this is over speculation. Oh, don't worry. I'll be able to make more money to pay it off later. Now, isn't that over speculation? Even I over speculate when I buy my car. I mean, I, I imagine it was safe. Like, oh, don't worry. Yes, I can buy a $40,000 car, which I didn't, by the way. But I can buy like a $100,000 car because I'm sure that I'll be principal by the time I'm like 24. I'm sure I'm sure this is likely and then I over speculate and now I have like a Right, but, but do you guys understand is that even though it's minor over speculation for each individual If enough people do a little bit of over speculation will it be just as bad as a lot of over speculation? And that's what's going to happen. So you guys kind of see us inching towards the edge of that cliff We're just getting close like oh, over speculating again. Ooh, on credit again. Oh, I don't like that, but it's happening deal with it also, again, here it goes. Guys, look, here's how they use advertising. 20,679 physicians say luckies are less irritating. It's toasted. Now, this is an advertisement from the 50s, guys, but this is one of the best, this is one of the best arguments. We knew already that cigarettes were causing cancer, so what's the best way? Because you can't make claims again that cigarettes are healthy anymore, but what and all cigarettes are pretty much made the same. So how do you uh, Set your. Yes. It's less irritating and it's toasted. But they're all toasted. But yours is toasted. Theirs causes cancer. Yours is toasted and it's less irritating. So in the 1950s, we take that exact same kind of mentality and we start marketing cigarettes and whatever else to make things a little bit more appealing to, to, to the common man. Uh, here again, you see an advertisement for a refrigerator. Here's how you keep it cold. You put a bowl of ice in it. And then that'll keep it for, it doesn't make ice. It needs ice in order to keep your, it's crazy. It's, what? You have to go to the store and buy ice. You have, to, yeah, you have to go to the store to buy ice to keep your refrigerator cold. But it'll circulate that ice. Bathing suits emerge for the first time. And you know, like, I don't know. That's a bit risque. Are women allowed to wear that? And that was the question. Also, you have the emergence, guys, of the cult of celebrity. And what did they use celebrity for? 
to market goods, to sell goods. I mean, today, don't we still have this? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't dare to buy cologne unless it was worn by Brad Pitt. That guy's successful. <laughs> that guy makes money. Clearly, he knows what he's doing. But that's the philosophy. If this is not a cologne from, like, Beyonce, then why am I even wearing it? If Beyonce drinks Pepsi, I'm drinking Pepsi. But this is what happens. And the cult of celebrity exists still today. For men, Babe Ruth. Hey, guys, Babe Ruth smokes old gold cigarettes. So if you want to be a great baseball player, smoke up. Old gold. Yes, not a cough in a carload. It's not as smoky. It's smoother and better. Here's the best one, in my opinion. World's breaststroke champion for five years. He's like one of the best swimmers in the world. Smoking camels at mealtime makes me feel that my digestion's off to a good start. And more camels after eating tops off a meal in great shape. So here's a swimmer that clearly needs good, strong lung capacity saying, you know what makes me swim really well? Smoking. <laughs> Smoking is just the best. It's for digestion's sake. Actually, my mother used to smoke when she was much younger. And she told me when we were kids still, like, she smoked because, you know, it's supposed to help your stomach. And she was a nurse. So it got to the point where this was a belief back then. This was actually something that happened. And then we realized, oh, no, that was a lie. <laughs> but again, is it, is it clear that this is a lie? Now we know. But back then, is it clear? No. You put off fact, at, you put off lies if it's fact and no one has any idea. No Lastly, folks, we'll touch on entertainment. Entertainment, guys. Entertainment begins with the standardization of American culture. Pretty much at this time, everyone begins to have the same kind of culture. Up until this point, did everyone in the country listen to the same music? No, like the North listened to something, the South listened to something, California had its own music, you know, New Orleans had its own music, New York had its own music. But then we start having radio. And then we start having movies. And what are movies going to tell us? Yeah, glo movies will start telling us what you should listen to, what you should wear, how your hair should be, what hats are in, what sports to like, what's the new slang. American culture will be standardized because we will see what is acceptable. Does everyone understand that point? Yeah, guys, I mean, look at all of our hair today. Our hair is roughly about the same today because movies and society tells us this is today what's kind of acceptable. And then maybe in like 30 years, we'll have like 1980s hair again and everyone's hair is all curled up and crazy like. But for today, long hair for men is not as common as it used to be. But did it used to be in the 70s and 80s? Sure. Because folks, what you'll also see is a rise of conformity. There's going to be a mold that's created. And is there an expectation that you have to fit that mold? Yes. If you're an American, you dress this way. You like this kind of music. You wear these. You fit the mold. Make sense? OK. One way to promote that mold, that conformity, that standard culture, was the radio. Only 146 bucks. It's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. It's very expensive. Yeah, but this is like, this is a fancy radio. Yes. Uh, well, again, a nickel could buy you a newspaper. Or like, a nickel could buy you milk. So imagine if a nickel is like $3. A penny was worth something back then, guys. We don't just have pennies. Like, just because we have, no, pennies was a currency that could be used. So one of the first radio stations, folks, was KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's the first radio station. It's classical music. You'll, you'll hear some of it before you leave today. KDKA is the first uh, radio station in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You should know it. And KDKA, it's a local radio station, by the way. It's the first radio station, but it's local. But eventually, you'll start seeing national broadcasting stations. National Broadcasting Centers uh, like NBC and CBS who will initially begin as radio stations and then will eventually what? Become television stations. 
and they became national radio stations. So again, KDKA was local in Pittsburgh. NBC and CBS eventually become national radio stations. NBC and CBS. Here they are, folks. If you notice, some of them were local at some time, and eventually you start seeing global radio stations start emerging from all these different areas. Pittsburgh, Madison, Chicago, Springfield, New York, Newark. These all become the major radio station hubs, and also California starts getting stations from them. So what kind of music did they listen to? Well, I'll play you guys out today with some music. <laughs> Live from KTLW's performance studio in Santa Monica, the California Ramblers, led by Dave Hudson. David, what do you have next for us? Broadway revival, uh, to the house 42nd Street. And uh, we're going to be featured on this, our uh, drama club player, and we're going to play violin uh, solo. And uh, if you don't have, who doesn't have the test yet? You know the song? It's 42nd Street. 42nd Street. Everyone knows what they need? All right, make sure you start working on your work, guys. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Bands? Bands have been around for years. I'm going to print it out right now.